All right, thank you. Hello. We're going to go back to having the PowerPoints on there and my face on the side by popular demand by a vote of one to zero. Others abstaining. We're going to give the uh, shared split screen another shot. And there it is. All right, so this is module six. And we're still doing a little bit of history. This will bring us up to the present. Module seven will be uh, a detailed description of my vision. Not that I'm teaching my vision per se, but it's a good starting point for discussion to know where things stand or what somebody that's given a fair amount of thought to this believes about it. All right, so here we are in 1983 and a national commission appointed by President Reagan's Secretary of Education has appointed a appointed a bipartisan commission, uh, some heavy hitters, big names on both sides, as bipartisan indicates. And by the way, President Reagan didn't support this initiative initially. But he sure made a big deal about it after it came out because he liked the uh, he liked what they had to say. Although it's in a sense hard to like statements this strong because it says we're in a heap of trouble. Uh, but nevertheless, you can like it, I suppose, for the fact that it draws attention to a problem that you would like to be an entrepreneurial uh, politician about, policy entrepreneurship, I call it. Right? So the educational foundations of our society are going down the tubes. And I would use a stronger term than mediocrity, but, uh, you know, still strong language, especially if you follow it up by a statement that's probably unequaled in its ability to catch one's attention. Uh, if you argue that you're doing something to yourself, that, uh, that an unfriendly power would, if an unfriendly power did it, it would be seen as an act of war. You, you've made a pretty strong statement. But as you'll see from the rest of this module, strong a statement as it might be, it wasn't strong enough for anybody to risk their political careers to take on the public finance monopoly, or even to address more directly some of the roots of the problem that we've been discussing all semester long. So here we have a couple of slides uh, of readings. Sorry about the purple there for the uh, clickable links to my op-eds. I tried to change the color, but it wouldn't let me. So uh, anyway, you can still sort of read them. Uh, and uh, if, if you can't click them directly, of course, you can cut and paste them into your uh, uh, browser and do it that way. All right, so what did we get out of these timid reactions to uh, an apocalyptic message that our country would no longer be recognizable and we wouldn't be competitive in the world and this was so bad that we would be, we'd seen it, see it as an act of war if somebody else, uh, foreign power, was seen to have, uh, be doing it to us. You remember back to the late 50s in the Defense Education Act? You might think that this is deja vu all over again because they indeed called for most, if not all of these things. And let's see, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, almost 30 years later, here we are once again calling for the same thing, imagining uh, that through higher expectations and leaning on teachers more and more class time, longer school years, more time in a classroom situation, which we've talked about early in the semester, is difficult at best and as challenging as you can make it. Uh, if you did, unless you did it deliberately, um, same old deal, better teachers, we're going to pay them more to get better people into teaching, we're going to raise the standards for getting into teaching after that, and but we're still going to throw them in classrooms that are almost impossibly unteachable, unless you just happen to be lucky and get a fairly homogenous group of children, again by homogenous I mean in terms of learning style issues, the homogenous means they are engaged by the same kinds of thematics or lack thereof in a comprehensively uniform uh, public school system uh, campus, uh, it's probably going to be lack thereof because any given theme will turn off probably most of the children. For example, that sports theme that I've been talking about all semester long. If you employed that in a traditional public school classroom, a couple of the kids, a few of the kids would probably get really excited and the rest of them would probably just totally tune out and not get any content out of it all. But still, you can get a fairly homogenous group of kids by luck every now and then uh, and do uh, a lot better job, not because you're doing any better work, but simply because uh, the kids are not as diverse in their learning style, styles and what interests them uh, as they might usually tend to be. All right, and uh, so 
there were few, if any, changes in the disengagement factors that I've noted several times in the course. Again, here we have a message from a national commission, not some right-wing group, not some left-wing group, not a bunch of nobodies jumping up and down and screaming, but the who's who of education in the United States in the early 1980s. And we get a pronouncement of more of the same. We get a call for the current system that created the mess that they said we were in to fix itself something for which there's little history, although I suppose some of that's been documented since then and perhaps wasn't that well known in 1983 or 1983 in April was when the report was published. So I suppose earlier 80s, uh, right after President Reagan and Secretary Bell took office in 1981, it's probably the time frame, the data and, and uh, research knowledge that they had at their disposal. This all led by 1988, the end of two terms and some failed eff efforts by President Reagan and others to use this uh, platform to enact some school choice legislation. This led in 1988 to the first presidential campaign uh, where one of the two candidates, and later on it was both candidates, but in the 1980 with K through 12 reform as a high priority. Think about that for a moment. There's nothing in the Constitution about the federal government had anything to do with schooling. The federal government not only provides, even to this day, 7 to 10 percent of the money spent to school, yet the President of the United States, or the candidates for that office uh, in 1988, just uh, Vice President Bush, later campaigns, both candidates, were announcing that the federal government, with no formal authority in K through 12, and little in the way of funding of it, was going to make K through 12 reform, a not only a high priority, but succeed at it. Right? So, uh, President, the Vice President Bush became President Bush, and he said he wanted to be the education president. That was a big part of his campaign. And so, he quickly convened the governors in an education summit, which included his successor. Of course, he didn't know that at the time, uh, but a leading uh, participant in the, in the uh, summit created by George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, eventually led to the 1994 Goals 2000 law that President Clinton, a chief architect of the uh, law while he was governor, uh, signed into law. Unfortunately, it was more of the same harder. A, coin, a phrase that I discovered and uh, used widely, discovered and used it widely in my book in 2001, The School Choice Wars, uh, and note also that 1994 is already 10 years after the alarm was sounded. And even in that time, uh, all we figured out a way to do was to say, we're going to do more of the same harder. Of course, nobody's called it that, but that's exactly what it was. And we're not going to challenge the funding and governance uh, practices that led to this. We're going to hope that we fix this with the same incentives, the same ways that we fund things, the same ways we reward and penalize at least the administrators and the politicians. I suppose there was quite a bit of discussion of that we're going to change the accountability for the actual frontline educators. But then, as we discovered when we tried that again with NCLB, No Child Left Behind, and 10 years later, uh, we didn't really mean it. In other words, we announced accountability, but when it came time to put it in effect, we didn't do uh, much of holding educators accountable. For that matter, we weren't exactly holding parents and students accountable either. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me just back up here to some of the preamble of the 1994 uh, law that was uh, uh, launched by Republican President George H.W. Bush and eventually signed into law by his successor, a Democrat, President Bill Clinton. And at the time, the Congress is also uh, a, a majority uh, Democrats in both houses. So, page 91, 91 of the law, more apocalyptic stuff, maybe trying to get people's attention. I don't know what, I'm not sure how many people would read that far into the bill, but there it is. We have a, basically a nation at risk two pronouncement. Uh, things are bad. And as the third phrase says there on page 115, it's getting worse. An educational emergency exists in those urban and rural areas. Uh, I would argue that it exists everywhere. 
That was one of the problems and the fallacy was that things are okay in the suburbs. You remember the Lake Will Be Gone effect where a lot of people believe that while the majority of schools are problematic, it's not theirs. And so, yeah, let's fix the system, but yeah, let's leave my school pretty much alone. Yeah, give it, send us better teachers. Sure, send us more money, but don't change any of the, any of the fundamentals. So legislators that are representatives rather than leaders, of course, put their finger up to the wind and they can figure out which way it's blowing and they can figure out that maybe we better look like we're doing something but maybe not actually do anything because if we change those suburban public schools that a lot of people think are fine uh, they won't know that that we've made them better until we've been voted out of office for making the attempt all right so again back to this notion of accountability uh, secretary of education uh, number two under uh, President Reagan was uh, Bill Bennett and he, he, he made a phrase that resonated then and still does. There it is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we need to hold people accountable for their effectiveness. Now think about this for a minute. That sounds good. Sure, we ought to hold people accountable. But what if they're unable to be accountable for whatever reason? Maybe the rules under which they operate preclude them from doing the things that they think that they should in order to be successful. Think about it from another perspective. So suppose you hold, held an infant accountable for not peeing in their in their diapers. Not going to work very well. They may not be capable, well, in the case of the infant, definitely not capable, but the educators and the system as a whole, in this case I do actually mean just the public school system, may not be capable of responding uh, to penalties uh, or to rewards based on the rules of the game and the other incentives that they face. Uh, so they may have been unable to to uh, improve and as a result we may have that may have been one of the reasons that we backed off on the accountability because there was far too much to for people to be accountable for we didn't provide the right kinds of rewards and punishments because we didn't exactly specify and decide what they should be there were claims in some places that there was going to be merit pay but then what actually came out if anything did at all perhaps still under the label of merit pay, was collective merit. We gave schools additional money for being higher performing, though perhaps not, still not overly high performing, higher performing than other schools. And then we let the principal or the group of teachers decide how to divvy up the money and maybe just divvy it up equally. Again, that's not merit pay. That may be wonderful to, to provide additional money to where there is success, but it doesn't reward individual merit, and that's what, indiv that's what merit pay means is individual merit, not school merit. Uh, also notice that the, for the public school system, when schools are meritorious, that doesn't necessarily provide them any additional revenue to pay out this merit pay. I suppose you could argue that, that if a whole district, or at least a large part of a district, is especially effective, more people want to live in that district, that'll drive up property values, that'll increase property tax revenues. But that's a pretty convoluted route from merit by individuals or even merit by individual schools to additional money to finance higher pay or increased budgets for those individuals or for those schools. Uh, and as we could tell uh, by the year 2000, because after all that's the, that was the deadline for those goals to be achieved, none of them were. And by the way, let's just a little sidebar, let's give President Clinton some credit for creating a law, for signing into law uh, something that at least would hold him and his administration accountable while they were still in office. Although I suppose you could argue that they can't run for re-election again after 1996. So, oh well, they're going to be criticized and be held accountable, but for what and how? Enter the No Child Left Behind Act that replaced the Goals 2000 Act after none of the, goal, the year 2000 goals were retrieve, achieved. And indeed, I haven't heard anybody say that the 2014 goals of the No Child Left Behind Act were achieved. And note from my previous comment that the second George Bush administration that created the No Child Left Behind Act set 2014 for the goals, which is one and a half terms into the administration that would succeed President Bush. And by the way, uh, as I mentioned already, none of those goals, as far as I know, have been met. Uh, and for the most part, the nation's report card, which as you know, I'm not all that 
excited about. Uh, none, of the, none of that shows a huge uptick, a slight uptick in some, in some uh, grade levels for the NAEP scores, but not any huge uptick in the scores. Uh, there was another national commission, not supposedly having anything to do with uh, national security. President Clinton created it. It reported in the first month of the, uh, the George Bush, the second administration, and it basically echoed what I, Admiral Hyman Rickover's 1999 or 1959 book said, that the shortcomings of the U.S. K-12 system are a national security threat. Now, we have a situation where we've had multiple pronouncements that we were having problems from within. We were threatening our very nature as a country from within by not doing a good job of educating all of our people. And now we have a second pronouncement that it also makes us more vulnerable to rapid demise from external threats. Yet we still don't have enough of a crisis, I suppose. Maybe that's what it would take, but we still don't have enough oomph enough push to get the political entrepreneurship, the policy entrepreneur, entrepreneurship that it would take to take on the reasons, the underlying reasons, the engineer, I mean the gardening reasons, if you recall that term from the first uh, module, the underlying policy reasons why we have the roots of the problem at the, at the classroom level. All right, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself again with the uh, NCLB Act. But it, where, where did it come from? Well, it came from the fact that from 1988 to the year 2000, things had gotten worse so that now, even though, the, again, the federal government has a relatively minor formal role in the K-12 through uh, system, now it was a top priority of both presidential candidates in the year 2000 election between uh, George W. Bush, our former governor here in Texas, or at the time he was the governor, and then uh, Vice President Al Gore from, uh, from the Clinton administration. Uh, and likewise, uh, by then, uh, and largely to this day and, and to some degree up till then, every major candidate for governor in every state had that as, if not their number one priority, right there at the top. By the 2004 election with the terrorist attack in, in uh, December, uh, September 20. Uh, 2001, presidential attention uh, was shifted to other things, not that they no longer paid attention to uh, education. They did. Uh, we can see that in the current administration, but it was at least no longer there a top priority. But still at the state level, every governor recognized that his or her state, while they may have even been ranked number one or two or three, that that wasn't good enough, that there were still serious deficiencies in every single state, and it was a major priority. Uh, to, uh, for them to address it. But again, still not important enough to any of them to push hard for transformative uh, systemic change. Now, one of the things that we can be glad that we had the No Child Left Behind Act for, and maybe that was the underlying major reason for it, was that at least we were going to get to know the depth and extent of how bad things are uh, and have been uh, a lot better with the better data demanded by the, by the new law. And so we do, in fact, as a result of NCLB, have a much clearer picture of how badly the 50 U.S. K-12 systems are performing. And again, few if any noteworthy gains, uh, even with this increased attention to problems at the school level, uh, problems at the sub-student uh, body public pub, uh, uh, level, for example, by sub-student body, I mean that we would now break the results down by certain subgroups, perhaps by low income, perhaps by Hispanic, perhaps by uh, African American, depending on, again, dependent on whether these were large groups within a given school. Uh, but again, uh, we have more of the same harder. We still are not threatening any of the key elements of the funding and governance processes that lead to the roots of the problem that we've been talking about. Uh, and much anecdotal evidence indicates that things have gotten worse in the untested academic subjects. Let me explain briefly what I mean by untested. I don't mean that the schools don't test it. I mean that these are that things like social studies and history and English. Well, English is part of reading, and and that's tested. But uh, English and, the, and those other subjects, 
Those may be tested at the school level, but those are not part of the top-down accountability measures. And so naturally, educators want to look good where looking good matters the most. So uh, they've switched time from the untested in the top-down accountability measures, the untested academic subjects, to test prep and to more time on reading and math and later on science, which are officially and formally tested subjects. And we don't see much change in the test scores where testing has become higher stakes, supposedly. Uh, well, there's that accountability thing, the threat, the promise accountability, rarely delivered. Uh, but we do see anecdotal evidence, right? It can't be other than anecdotal because there aren't any test scores to lean on. Every time I run into a teacher, I ask them, have you narrowed the curriculum to the things that are on the uh, state assessment? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we spend time. To, well, what about all that other stuff that used to, uh, that we used to spend that same class time? Yeah, we're not spending as much time on that. We're suffering in the areas that, uh, you know, we're not providing as much time in the areas that are not on these uh, assessment, uh, top-down accountability assessment tests. All right, I'll get a, a little bit ahead of myself earlier talking about the threat of accountability, but the failure to deliver, maybe. As I was uh, uh, speculating earlier, maybe that was the result of, oops, the deadlines are here and we've threatened all these things. If we follow through on these things, we're going to be shutting down an awful lot of schools or firing or sanctioning a whole lot of people and eh, they're voters and the parents are not going to like us kicking them out of their schools or changing their teachers, even if by our objective measures things are not working out all that well. So, as Hess said in 2006, when the deadlines have gotten there, the people doing the threatening, demanding accountability, the top-down, heavy-duty uh, officials, heavy-duty, I mean the ones that are supposed to come on and do things to those who have not, by uh, the formal measures, held up their end of the job, they've backed off and delayed. Oops, let's just wait another year or two and do this. Peterson went further uh, four years later in his book, Saving Schools, the country ended up with a system in which accountability was more apparent than real. And we have an, an educational system in which nothing counts, which makes it hard to trust the accountability measures that might even exist. Uh, and this phrase, I keep looking at it and getting ready for our discussion on Thursday, and I've looked at it at other times and thinking, you know, what can I do to write up a little blog essay, maybe a whole academic article, to talk about symbolism over substance? And I think I better not name names when I write up this uh, blog essay, but it seems to me a lot of governors are fattening their resumes with nice sounding words. For example, with the voucher programs, they're creating charity vouchers so they can say to their, if they're Republican, to their conservatives that they need to get past either to get reelected or maybe to run for president someday. And, oh, yeah, we created school choice. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I authored and, and passed the voucher program. Never mind the details that say that the voucher program was severely restricted, maybe small dollar amounts, maybe limited to children in low-performing schools, maybe limited to children of low income. And so there was no real change in the system as a whole, just a voucher program that allowed a few people to escape the public school system for a better school for them. And by the way, that is an accomplishment, but it isn't what they alleged, perhaps, perhaps implicitly alleged, that they were actually doing something to change the system as a whole rather than to get a few people to be able to escape it. Uh, so anyway, I'm pondering that blog essay, figuring out how I can make it a good essay without naming any names. And why don't I want to name names? Well, because I can't get into the heads of these various political officials to see how sincere they are. I don't know. It sure looks suspicious to me, though. They keep passing laws that have certain key buzz phrases for certain groups that they need to uh, curry favor with, but then there isn't enough substance there to really make the system any different, and I'm kind of wondering whether that's deliberate. All right, so consistent with some of the last couple of PowerPoints that we've been going through, we have got a list of what didn't change. Still no price signals. We're still assuming... Implicitly, perhaps, and well, not um, no, 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 not implicitly, probably implicitly. Uh, it's amazing to me that when our whole economy runs on price signals, virtually nobody is aware of that fact and how important that is. Perhaps this is part of our problem with K-12, lack of economic education. 
But even some economists, price theorists, are not making a big deal about the fact that we have a price-controlled industry and all the pr pronouncements about fixing it don't say much of anything about how we're going to make it price decontrolled, that we're no longer going to pretend that there's something about schooling that can allow it to be what no other industry has ever been, namely high performing, without dynamic market driven price signals. Uh, so we still don't have that, even though there, there ought to be a lot of people demanding it, or at least demanding an explanation for why schooling is going to be different, able to grow and thrive and, and reach a high performing level without the thing that requ that's required to make every other industry high performing, namely dynamic price signals based on supply and demand. All right, so here we have our short semicolon list of the things that are the same, all of those things that sustain the roots of the problem. Attendance zones, where we're going to classify, I'm sorry, uh, sort children just by neighborhood, and then once they get into school, by age. Uh, not by ability grouping, by subject, which is the kind of sorting that we need. Funding continued to grow up, and, up until the Great Recession, where it backed off a little bit. Uh, the federal government prevented some of the uh, retrenchment through the uh, huge increase in funding at the federal level. We still have difficulty firing bad teachers. As you know from Eric Hanyashek's research cited a couple modules ago, if we would just get rid of the 5, five to 8% worst teachers and replace them with average teachers, our, teach, our school system, public plus private, would be among the top performers at the international level. Now, unsaid, at least in that research, but not unsaid by me, is that, wow, the best in the world is only 5 to 8% better than we are, and all it takes is getting rid of our worst teachers and replacing them with average teachers. Wow, we must have a potential to improve by a lot more than 5 to 8%, and indeed we do, and that means that the world's best are still not all that great. But I digress. We still have one-dimensional tracking in some places. We still think about children as good, average, uh, and, and uh, low performing rather than the multi-dimensional people that they probably are with strengths and weaknesses. Uh, each campus is still a random sample from the neighborhood. Each classroom or each grade is still a same age random sample. We still pay teachers more just on, based on how long they've been teaching and whether they get uh, an a different credential and not necessarily even the one that would be especially useful, but just generically a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And by the way, the single salary schedule is just not just something that unions have demanded in other states like Texas use because unions are strong even though we don't have collective bargaining, but it was started off as a progressive plan to stifle politically motivated favoring of some teachers. So it was started with as a reason to prevent, prevent politicking and the hiring and, and, uh, and uh, uh, paying teachers more, and then it became politically correct to keep it uh, because it became entrenched and we didn't want to do the difficult thing of identifying merit on an individual basis. We're going to discuss uh, school-based reforms a little bit more later on. But one of the problems that we need to discuss right now is the fact that all of these school choices, and I, I literally mean all, no matter how small they are, you find the word market attached to them occasionally. Even the, and as a result, they've generated a lot of hype, a lot of research. And for example, charter schools, even though there are no prices and in most states no profits, have been alleged to be school choice, which by the way, they're not very often either. And be, and of course, if they're school choice, a lot of people are going to say their markets at work. Again, let me explain why I say they're not even school choice, because once they fill up, which is almost immediately before they even open, after they've been announced, there's a long wait list, and as a result, you can't choose them. Uh, the school choice initiatives that we've had the bottom line is they've been far too limited to imitate markets or to leverage market forces, which would include leveraging major entrepreneurial activity. Uh, we have meaningful, though small and still restriction-laden, voucher programs only in a handful of states. Milton Friedman called them all charity vouchers. He said, 
uh, as recently a year before his death in 2006 that we needed to move on to reform vouchers, large unrestricted voucher programs where the large sums would be portable across uh, lines between public and private schools and you'd be able to add on to them with your own money if you wanted to buy more schooling for your child than the public funding would, would finance. As I've noted before, I think the chartered public schools, because virtually everybody provides at least rhetorical support for them, provides our best opportunity to quickly move forward uh, with, with transformative school system reform. But in their current state, all of them, from strong to weak, have significant restrictions that preclude them from, in their current state, being much more than they are, which is, in most places, a fringe element that a few children might be lucky enough to escape to before they close up uh, uh, with the uh, uh, wait lists that are so long that it's school chance, not school choice. So even in the states with the strongest charter laws, major restrictions persist. The biggest one is that it has to be free. So that means that charters that want to do something that costs more than the public funding amount are donor dependent, which means that they're going to have very, very long wait lists because, yes, they're doing something that is costly and therefore probably ought to be higher quality. And so more people will want to get into them, but because they're donor dependent, they can't provide that many slots. And so major restrictions exist. The major one is the, the largest one of all is the price control that continues to persist in all 43 states, 42 states plus D.C. I'll call state D.C. a state for the moment. Uh, and then the other uh, major restriction that exists in virtually all states, and I've been told that the federal government will eventually get after the other states if they ever try to uh, do what it says in their charter laws that, it, that it's okay to have mission-based selective admission requirements, and that's what we mean. We don't want selective admission based on uh, uh, historic grounds for discrimination, color, race, etc. But we do want these chartered public schools to be able to specialize if they want to. So for example, if they want to specialize in something, well, let's just go back to my sports theme school, or say a charter, charter public school wants to specialize in gifted and talented children. Well, it seems to me that if they're going to do either one of those, that they've got to sort out the children that are in the one case for the one kind of school that are not gifted and talented. And for the sports theme school, they'd probably want to make sure that Johnny or Susie that wants to get in is really jazzed up about sports so they don't sit there in a the classroom with a bunch of other sports nuts and look bored. Uh, and you'd think, well, why would their parents want to send their children to a sports theme charter school if Johnny or Susie is not all excited about reading, writing, doing math and studying government is somehow surrounded by a sports story. Maybe the alternative, the assigned public school is so bad that any alternative looks good. And as a result, this causes a lot of people to send their children to charter public schools, even when there isn't a match or maybe even a mismatch between the child's characteristics and the particular mission that the chartered school might want to pursue. And I emphasize might want to pursue if they can't select according to mission-based criteria, select children that can enter based on mission, the, 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 according to criteria based on the school's mission, for example, like gifted and talented, how on earth are they going to be able to specialize in that mission if they have a bunch of children not interested in it in, in, in some cases or not able to keep up, perhaps, if it's a gifted and talented specialized school? Uh, we'll have to get into the politics and economics of charter law design and reform uh, later on. Uh, that'll probably be part of my uh, vision statement. I say probably because I don't remember for sure if it's in module seven or eight. So here we are towards the end of our uh, module six discussion. So let us review again what we, where we started and how we progressed. In the early 90s, uh, the uh, federal uh, Department of Education Secretary Terrell Bell uh, I know you're too, you may be too young. That was Secretary uh, President Reagan's sec first Secretary of Education, uh, followed later on by Bill Bennett, who uh, is better known. He created a national commission that came out with that apocalyptic-sounding language that I had on my have on my first slide. Uh, Reagan 
uh, President Reagan, his boss, embraced that to try to win some reforms from Congress, which he was unable to do. Uh, then along came about a decade later, after lots of state commissions and lots of frenzied effort to do something in response to this apocalyptic sounding language in the First Nation at Risk report that demanded at least the symbol, symbolic, we're doing something, even though it might, have, might be something that hasn't worked before, or doesn't look like it's going to work, heroic assumption expecting a system that created the terrible problems to be able to do more, to do it better, and ultimately fix itself under the same incentives and same conditions that created the problem to begin with. Then, less well known, we had what I call other nation at risk reports. Okay, in 94, we had the Congress's Goals 2000 Act with all of those apocalyptic sounding uh, sentences that I read to you earlier uh, that basically said we hadn't done anything since 1983, at least they couldn't show any uh, results from it. And so in 1998, Checker Finn, who was an Assistant Secretary of Education for the first George Bush and Bill Bennett, who was se Second Secretary of Education for President Reagan, issued uh, a nation still at risk report, which I call nation at risk three. And then the report that I mentioned earlier uh, that wasn't had anything to do officially about with national security had several pages in it that said that the poor performance of K through 12 was a national se security threat. I call that nation at risk four. And then there's nation at risk five, which I, which, which I call nation at risk five, which is the 2000 Common Core still at risk report. Notice that each one of these reports, well, with the possible exception of number three, because Bennett and Finn are both Republicans, uh, though very moderate versions of them, uh, with, the, with the possible exception that all of those are reports that are not created by people on one end or the other of the political spectrum. These are all pronouncements that there are still serious problems, perhaps just as serious, maybe more serious than 1983, and but still pronouncement after pronouncement, national security threat on top of an economic competitiveness threat, still no willingness to take on the key underlying causes of this low performance. Thank you very much. We'll see you in class later this week.